But right here in Conference Hall 1, we will be talking about an industry that is crucial to the development of technology. Folks, we are going to be talking about semiconductors and whether it will be the next trillion dollar industry. To answer that very big question, we are glad to have with us Mr. Elvin Vong, the CEO of Equity Striker, and Mr. Benny Lee, the Chief Market Strategist at Equity Striker. They're both also SGX Academy trainers, so they'll be familiar faces to many of our viewers. Elvin, Benny, are semiconductors the next big thing? Hi, thank you, Edward, and uh, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I know you have been, uh, um, it's really in the evening. You guys have um, since been here since the morning, right? So I hope today's uh, presentation, which is actually mostly going to be done by Alvin, uh, I'll be looking at the chart aspect of the, uh, the stocks that we'll be covering. Um, but then again, uh, we really hope that you'll be able to learn, uh, you know, whether the semiconductor industry is going to be a one you one trillion dollars industry and if you guys have any questions uh, you can just type it uh, down on the slido okay alvin all right thanks uh, benny uh welcome everybody good afternoon i hope you guys are gonna stay uh, i can keep you guys awake uh, during this session now we're gonna be talking about semiconductors and, and i think uh when we do talk about semiconductors it it is you know uh i think it's not very much a household name right um you know if i ask you guys you know uh you know Everything that we use today from your fridge, uh, you know, wake up in the morning, you make your coffee, uh, you know, we all have semiconductors, even in our cars when we drive to work, um, of course, always in our pockets before we go to sleep, uh, we use semiconductors. So it's kind of really everywhere, but the, the industry is actually fairly complex uh, in the sense that uh, for, 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 let's say, Apple or Samsung to actually uh, create that phone for you, there are hundreds and thousands of steps or processes involved. Therefore, I think when we try to analyze uh, semiconductor companies themselves, uh, I think for most retail investors, it, it can get a bit overwhelming. Uh, on top of that, on top of that, when you're talking about second tier or third tier, so if they say Apple is the end customer, uh, they would then outsource it to a company, right? Then that company will buy equipment from other companies, and these companies buy equipment from other companies, right? So it's a fairly long and complex uh, supply chain, and, it, and it's really a global supply chain as well. So for, for, uh, you know, for a retail investor, it, it can be quite daunting to see, you know, and, and on top of that, when you are second, third or second tier or third tier or even fourth tier, a lot of times, even though you are a public company, um, you are actually not allowed to disclose because they, are a lot of, they have a lot of non-disclosure agreements, right? Uh, of course, then, you know, you kind of leaves you guessing who is their end customer uh, because you actually need to, you actually need um, uh, to kind of gauge where the end customer is to kind of, see where the demand is, right? So in today's session, we're gonna talk, uh, we're gonna start off really big picture, right? Um, will semi the semiconductor industry be a tri the next trillion dollar industry? Now, when we talk about trillion dollar industry, we mean uh, in terms of sales for these products, right? Now, in terms of market cap, a lot of, a lot of uh, semiconductor companies, you know, combined, they're already, right now they're worth about $4 trillion, right? Uh, and they've grown four times, right, since uh, 2015. So. Uh, you know, if you're looking to invest in semiconductor companies, uh, if they grow to, uh, they, they, they double in sales, right? Uh, generally in the whole industry, of course, not everyone will double. Some might more than double. Uh, uh, you know, those kind of, uh, you know, if you look at 4X returns in the last uh, five to six years, uh, that may happen again. So today, this session, we really want to discuss, right? Will that happen? Um, or what are the driving forces, right? Um, and I think it's great that we're having it now, this timing, because a lot of these semiconductor, or, uh, when I'm going to put it in inverted commerce technology stocks, have actually come down, come down off their high, right? Some, some of them are down 20, 30%. Uh, and, and of course, Benny, my, my colleague here, Benny, will be going through uh, those specific charts. We will be talking, uh, covering a few companies. I know we have an hour, so I want to try my best to kind of deliver uh, a, a very short presentation on um, how they work and maybe for some of the companies that are listed on the SGX, uh, what, what do they do in that supply chain, right? Uh, and maybe some of the pros and cons as well. Uh, so, so I'm gonna just share my slides now. Um, yeah, I hope you guys can see the slides. All right, so of course, uh, nope. Okay, so this is, uh, hang on, let me just, sorry about that. Let me just make sure that we are sharing those slides. Uh, 
was working just now. Okay. Oops. Okay, let me share it now. Okay, I think that should be working now. All right. Okay, so I, I think let's talk about you know what 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 is driving uh, the demand for semiconductors. I think one of the new uh, one of the new things that. Uh, you know, here I presented a, a Tesla robot, right? So I think, I think when people talk about Tesla, they think of it as a car company. Um, some may say it is a software company, right? Uh, you know, Elon Musk is calling himself the world's largest robotics company, right? Uh, and, and we'll look at some of the reasons why, right? So if you look at uh, where we are up to today, we're now 2022. Uh, you know, most of the internet that we know of uh, today, right, up to now, so those of you who are millennials or, or you know, Generation Alpha or even baby boomers, uh, you would know the internet as really the internet of people, which means that all of us created or generated that data, right? When you post a picture on Facebook or Instagram or now videos on TikTok or YouTube, uh, most of this content is actually generated by humans, right? Uh, we've now come into a second phase of, uh, the internet, where uh, by actually 2018, we're, re we're already in there, right? Uh, right now, computers generate more data than humans generate, right? Uh, of course, largely due to uh, AI technology, right? Or artificial intelligence. So if you're thinking what, you know, what is uh, AI or, you know, does AI even um, uh, work, right? Sorry. Okay. Let me just kind of switch that again. Um, that slide didn't show up. Hang on, let me, let me, so somehow my previous slide is not showing. Uh, okay, there we go. Okay, great, thanks. Sorry about that. Okay, so, so you got to realize that actually most, uh, most of the data, the, most of the internet we know of today is actually known as uh, the internet of people, right? Now, of course, a lot of you guys have heard of IoT or internet of things, right? Um, it's already happened, it is happening today. Uh, you know, if you have, uh, how, how, would you, how would we interact with AI every day? We don't even know of, right? Uh, so if you have a Gmail account, you know, where it automatically moves into a spam folder or when you are watching a video and then YouTube serves you a, a, a video that's similar, right? Um, and, uh, or, you know, if you are shopping online and, uh, you know, of course there's cookies, but then they kind of follow you around and, and a lot of these big internet companies are, have already deployed AI, right, to, to learn more about you. So as of 2018, uh, machines now have generated more data. So really, I think the, the era of computing that we know of, which is basically your, 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 your smartphones or your, your laptops, uh, you know, that's what we know, right? But I think uh, what's kind of brewing under that's not very much a household name or uh, we don't even know it's there is really AI, right? Um, and a lot of these uh, chips that, uh, a lot of these, to power AI, you actually need a, a new array of chips, right, uh, to be developed. So assuming that we have the existing market and that market is growing, right? Um, and then you have a new, new, uh, new market now, right, which is AI, right? Uh, of course, one of the main things that power AI in the physical world are actually uh, computer chips, right? Uh, so by 2025, now this is where it's going that quickly, right? Um, applied materials, uh, one of the you know, uh, very large semiconductor uh, equipment makers in the world, uh, they are saying by 2025, which is three years from now, 99% of the data that will be on the internet will actually be generated by machines, right? Not by us humans anymore. So it can kind of give you a feel of how large that data set is, because if you look at the amount of data we have on the internet today, it's immense, right? Uh, human generated data, but now computer generated data, it's, 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 it's gonna be you know, a uh, hundred times bigger than what we're seeing today. Now, of course, when we when we talk about AI, uh, you know, the, let me just kind of move my slides to make sure you guys can see. Yep, you know, I, I think some basic things you'll see is of course the internet that I talked about. Of course, transport. You know, I think it goes without saying. Maybe you know, five years ago, we was most people were still toying with the idea: will electric cars be real? I think looking at the capex spending for a lot of the major automotive companies today, uh, in the next ten years, um, they they will likely only sell electric cars, right? So. That, that is also another, another juncture, right, where uh, a lot of 
very powerful chips will have to be produced for this segment, right? Uh, versus maybe cars of today or even five years ago, the number of chips in there um, are even more, right? Uh, now, of course, I think something we also don't see is really healthcare and, of course, education as well. So I think AI kind of spreads everywhere, right? So it's almost very generic. Um, to give you an idea why uh, AI is going to be, uh, is really going to overtake what humans can do, because obviously they can do it much faster than machines. They don't take off days. Uh, pandemic doesn't really affect them, right? Um, but, you know, what we saw up to today, you know, with the power of the internet and the growth of the internet, you know, it's very much human generated. Uh, which means that you have, you know, hundreds and thousands of engineers, right, behind writing code. Um, what AI will bring about is basically computers will start writing their own code, right? They are already doing it now. So, so, so that, that, that exponential growth because of the physical limitations we have as human beings, that exponential growth is something that I, I think it's, 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 it's going to be, uh, it, it's, not for, it's not maybe, I think it's definitely going to happen, right? Okay, uh, so uh, Mr. Ta, I think I see some some questions on um, on uh, SGX. So I will I will relate it to what's happening in SGX as well. Um, I'm actually in Malaysia at the moment, and you know I think in the last decade we've we've seen uh, I think one of the fastest growing industries uh, in this in, in Malaysia in the last decade has really been the semiconductor space, right? Uh, for those of you who you know have driven up to Penang, uh, you're gonna see you know that's really where all the Global semiconductor players are located as well. So Malaysia and Singapore are uh, we're very tied in together because a lot of the Singapore listed companies uh, also have plants in Malaysia as well. So so you kind of you, you see it's very very symbiotic here, right? Now of course when we talk about AI, you know you know we talk about memory, that's logic, that's networking, right? So uh, without really going into the details, right? Uh, but really just to give an idea, that's really where that push for uh, semiconductor will happen. Okay, right. Now, I, I think to put it into perspective as well, uh, you know, when I when I did computer science in university over 20 years ago, right, uh, what we know of, of uh, computer chips are really CPUs, right, central post processing unit, if you guys remember. So uh, your laptop today will be known as a CPU, right? So a CPU is pretty much general purpose. So anything also can do, can run Windows, can run your Mac, you know, it's just very gen general, right? Um, and then I think in, uh, you know, in my teenage years or my young adult years, right, uh, we play a lot of computer games, right? Uh, then this thing came about called GPUs, right? Graphical processing units. So we're a very specialized type. Uh, if you're not heard of them, uh, you know, one of the largest in the world, the other largest in the world is NVIDIA. So they're really focused only on GPUs, right? Now, of course, another side story is, you know, the use of GPUs have also gone through a roof, not just by computer gaming. Uh, you know, in the last decade, the most recent application is actually uh, the use of crypto, right? So they use GPUs in crypto as well uh, for mining. Uh, uh, now, then really came about, I think this is where, uh, I, I won't say it's brand new, but I think they're getting more popular, uh, what they call TPUs, uh, uh, NPUs, and FGPAs, and ASICs, right? Now, uh, what is an ASIC? Uh, ASIC is basically an application-specific integrated unit, right? So we have a CPU, which is general purpose. Everyone also can use. But when it comes to AI computing, um, ASICs play a more important role because they are application-specific. That means you only want it to do one thing and it does it really, really well, right? It's not a general purpose, right? Uh, so example, you know, it's like, a, like an F1 car, right? An F1 car is not good for you to go and pick up groceries. Uh, or send your kids to school, right? It only does one thing, and it's just to go around the track as fast as possible, right? Uh, uh, so that, so just to give you an analogy, that that's what ASICs are, right? So a tensor processing unit or neural processing unit, uh, it's 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 a type of ASIC basically, right? Um, so what we are now seeing is that the current com computing trend in terms of chips today, the you know right now is five hundred billion US dollars a year. Um, we are really only just touching the surface because it's just your personal computers and your smartphones, right? And your gadgets here and there, right? Uh, but generally, that's where the bulk of the semiconductors are used today. Now, so if, if this maintains costs, even at 500, it slowly grows, say, in the next 10 years to maybe 700 billion US dollars. Um, that bigger gap is going to be filled by these kind of specialized chips. Now imagine for a moment, right? Uh, I think in COVID, I think most of us have experienced this, right? A lot of car companies cannot actually produce cars uh, because uh, there's a lack of lack of chips, right? Um, so 
So they also, they don't use GPUs, right? So it's not, they don't use CPUs, not general processing units. So they are also very specific. So now if you factor in uh, even more specific um, uh, processing uh, semiconductors, right? Uh, you're seeing a new, completely new architecture or supply chain that needs to be produced, right? So a lot of our production facilities now can produce your CPUs, your GPUs, and for your smartphones, right? Um, a lot of the ASIC uh, type uh, lines actually have yet to be built, right? Um, and I think there was a question on how will it relate to some of these SGX companies. And, and that's where I think, I think we're very lucky, right? Because SGX has uh, quite a few fairly good uh, semiconductor companies that are uh, tied to the semiconductor industry, right? So they don't produce semiconductors per se, right? Um, uh, but they're very much part of the ecosystem. Okay. Uh, so yeah, just, just to highlight, you know, uh, you know, these application specific units are, you know, hundred to a thousand times more uh, efficient than your CPUs, right? Okay. So, and, and also I think, I think these AI chips right now, we, we've not, we've really kind of just scratched the surface. A lot of these billion dollar companies that are not listed, um, they're not household names. So you, you may not have actually heard of them. Right. Okay. Now, uh, to give you an idea here as well uh, on what has happened in the last, uh, you know, sixty years, right? Uh, it took it took the whole industry sixty years to reach five hundred billion dollars, right? Uh, so imagine the speed of things when um, it's going to be taking uh, another another ten years to reach five hundred billion. So that that speed of growth is actually quite immense, right? And then really that's what we're looking for because I'm a value investor. So, you know, if you look at, you must look at growth and value at the same time, right? So you must first start with the big picture. Does the big picture look rosy or not, right? Uh, I think that's very, very important. And then of course, then you bet on the right horse, right? Okay, so uh, now, so yeah, so the Global Foundry is one of the largest uh, outsourced uh, manufacturers in the world today. Um, he's saying that the current industry needs to double their capacity in the next eight to 10 years. Otherwise, already today we have shortages, right? Uh, if they don't double their capacity, uh, you know, so it, kind of imagine this for a moment, right? Like if you're a newly developing country, you know, you don't have a lot of infrastructure built, right? So for you to have the infrastructure built and, and that's really where uh, uh, I believe uh, it's going to be needed. You know, there's, there's a lot of capex going to be spent here. Um, and that's really where it will propel some of these equipment makers um, forward. Okay. Um, hi, YF, how are you? I can see some of the comments here, All right? Uh, so I, I think, you know, we're really kind of coming down from a peak here. So I think it's great timing that we are talking about semiconductors, right? Now let's talk about, um, you know, one other factor here uh, that's driving the semiconductor, uh, semiconductor boom here. Uh, is really geopolitical, right? This is not technology. This is not, um, uh, uh, you know, unable to produce technology or, or, or produce it or lead times or shortages, right? Um, it's very much geopolitical, right? Uh, which, you know, I think most of you investors here would know uh, back in 2016 when Trump became president, you know, the first thing he did was, uh, uh, you know, uh, with, with Huawei, uh, what they did with Huawei, right, was to ban them and, you know, they, they, you know, there was this whole big thing over 5G and, and you know, all the countries, all the Western countries banded together against uh, China, right, uh, because they didn't want to be dependent on China. So, one of the geopolitical factors here uh, is the push for not only creating capacity, um, you want to create capacity outside of China, which means that uh, the US chip makers today, which are still the largest, that means they, they, they are all the brains and the designers, uh, they, they, they are now forced to look for alternatives outside of China, right? So which means that even though a line exists in China for them to use, uh, they are not able to, they have to go and look, look look somewhere else that, are, that is not China, right? Um, now, where does Singapore sit in all this? Um, actually, Singapore sits in the very front row uh, of where, or being part of the US chip manufacturing, right? Uh, about 17%, uh, this is of 2020, 2021 here, uh, of uh, US chip manufacturing actually takes place um, in Singapore, right? Singapore slash Malaysia, right? As an extended party, right? Uh, so, so you can see that they're reducing the reliance on China, right? And they're trying to push everything outside, anywhere but China, basically. It's anywhere but China policy. Okay. Um, so you can see that, uh, that, that really, 
um, where are the where are the bright spots for uh, semiconductor? I think Malaysia and Singapore uh, for the last two or three decades, for long, you know, we've very much been in the semiconductor space. Uh, so it's not new, of course. A lot of it's also going to Vietnam as well, um, outside of China, uh, and a lot of it is now forced to be moved back to US itself, right? So TMSC she even set up. Uh, uh, a facility in, in the US, right? Not because it's cheaper, not because you know there's more labor, uh, purely for geopolitical reasons. So we're gonna see these are the main drivers uh, going forward in the next decade, right? Because uh, a lot of people are expecting uh, Joe Biden to actually change his stance with China. Um, it, you, we can see right now that has not happened as well. Yeah, so it, it's a continuous thing that we're seeing. And, and we're now, you know, from 2016 and 2022, right? We're now you know, six, seven years coming in, in, into this geopolitical game, right? Now, in terms of Singapore, uh, who are the main players? Now, I, a lot of the, the Singapore listed players, um, a lot of them, I would consider them as uh, third tier, right? Third or maybe fourth tier, right? Which means if example, if the end customer is Apple, um, then, then let's say they outsource everything to TSMC, right? Then TSMC would then have to work with different suppliers, right, to, uh, to, to get the equipment, right? So because TMC, TSMC is a pure foundry play, which means uh, in, in a nutshell, how, how, you know, how does the kind of business model works for semiconductor? So you have the owners of the product or the chip designers, right? So they do the design, they are fabulous, which means they don't own any manufacturing plants. They would then outsource the whole manufacturing part to say TMS, TSMC, right? And they are the largest in the world today. Now, TSMC will then have to hire the people, um, set up the facility, they have to do all the QC and everything. They will then have to buy equipment from a chip making equipment companies, right? Um, and then these chip making equipment companies then actually look for partners to work with, right? Because uh, they, don't, they don't create them, everything themselves. Just like a car company, right? They, they, don't, they work with a lot of suppliers to actually come, to come together and get a car. So that's quite similar uh, in a sense for the semiconductor industry. So, um, so what we're looking at is probably fourth tier, uh, fourth to fifth tier, right, uh, in this space, okay? Now, the beauty of being a, an equipment uh, supplier to this space, number one, they are capex dependent, which means that uh, when, when you see that a lot of these uh, companies are building capacity, they will most likely be beneficiaries, right? Uh, because they need to buy new equipment to build new lines, right? Um, second thing is that they're less... I would say less susceptible to geopolitical influence, less, lah, but I won't say none at all, okay? Uh, less being that, you know, US is not going to force them to move out of China because their products are mobile, right? Which means that if you build a production line, for example, like what's happening in TSMC, where they're feeling a little more pressure, is that they have to go to the US, find land, build it, and, and, and create those lines there. But the machines to create semiconductors can be brought from around the world. Yeah. So a lot of the listed company players in, uh, in Singapore today actually fall into that category. Right? They don't actually build the lines, right? So they support that industry. So I, th I think some of them are quite household names. Uh, if you are uh, you know, a seasoned SGX investor, you, know, you would have heard of Franken, UMS, uh, GBT, uh, Micromechanics, right? uh, AEM. Right? So this is kind of where, where they kind of sit, right? uh, where, they, where they sit in that space, right? Uh, I just done a, a very simple chart to give you an idea as well, right? Uh, now, four of the five biggest SGX listed semiconductor players here are basically precision parts uh, makers, which means that they supply the equipment makers, right? Who then the equipment is then sold to guys like TSMC. TMC produces those chips and you know uh, does it for Apple, for example. So that's that's kind of how how it works. Okay, uh, so I'll pass it on Benny here to talk a little bit about um, you know the NASDAQ performance versus the S&P 500. Okay, thanks, Alvin. So basically, we have um, quite strong performances even in the short term and also in the long term for tech companies. And of course, Semiconductor is um, the, the enabler for tech companies, right? So if you want to look at terms of performance, um, benchmarking basically the NASDAQ Composite Index versus the broader US market index, which is the S&P 500, right? So if you look at the 10-year performance, um, NASDAQ has actually gone up 423% uh, in over the 10-year period. Uh, up to about last week, right? The S&P has gone up uh, 217%, right? So it's almost like double the performance of the broad market, right? Uh, so if you look at the, the you know, the, the catalyst for markets basically is still uh, by the tech sectors. And of course, this spill on to also 
um, you know, the other stock markets as well, including Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, so if you look even at the uh, short-term uh, performance, uh, the five-year performance, you can see it's quite consistent, right? Uh, NASDAQ has gone up 168% over the past five years. Uh, S&P has gone up about 88%. Also the same, it's almost like double. So that means that if the broader market goes up 10%, the uh, NASDAQ, uh, which are basically technology stocks, has gone up uh, 20%. It's two times more, right? So the trend is still here to stay. And this is, of course, one of the unstoppable trends that we are talking about, uh, not only in the short term, but probably in the long term as well. Right. So I'll go back to you, Alvin. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Benny. So let's let's look at some of the uh, Singapore champions now. The the I, I know I only have an hour to do this, so I will kind of go through them briefly. Now, if you stay till the end, I'm going to give you guys a link where we actually read, uh, wrote a very large, uh, uh, a very uh, detailed two part report uh, on the semiconductor industry relating directly to Singapore. Right. Uh, this is done by Equity Tracker. So I, I think the first one uh, probably needs no introduction. I think UMS, uh, very much they are actually in precision machining. Now, you know, when, when we kind of look at some of these uh, uh, semiconductor companies, because they sign NDAs, right, non-disclosure agreements, they actually really can't disclose uh, who their clients are. But I guess, you know, some of these smart analysts will kind of poke and prod and kind of get, get an idea as well, right? Uh, uh, so UMS is, uh, is founded by... Uh, Mr. Andy Long, and he, you know, he's in business for 40 over years, right? Uh, very much precision parts. So when we talk about precision parts, what do we actually mean? Now, when you build some of this um, equipment, right, for to build semiconductors, so really semiconductors, you know, I think come to the point where you can't have humans to do it anymore. You know, it's not like an assembly line where you humans, you know, um, soldering stuff onto, onto a chipboard. It doesn't happen. It's 100% run by machines, right? So uh, when it's 100% run by machines uh, and when chips get smaller and smaller and smaller, you know, you know we're talking about nanometer, right? Um, that's where some of these specialist precision engineering companies uh, come in, right? Which means that they absolutely have to be precise, right? 99 point, you know, more than six sigma, for example, right? Uh, correct in terms of machining. So uh, when you talk about, you know, I, I think maybe 20, 30 years ago, some of this precision engineering was probably not as, uh, uh, or clients didn't require this kind of precision. But now as, uh, as, as chips get smaller and more sophisticated and, uh, you know, very important is the QC, right? Uh, it's less prone to error. Um, the, the need for precision engineering is even more. Right now, what their business model very much kind of works is like this: um, they actually work with their client to build their product. So uh, versus the client will come and say, "Hey, you know what? Um, uh, build this for me." Right. So they actually work very closely together, and a lot of a lot of these uh, players in this space, uh, you know, they say, "Okay, well, let's develop this together." But which means that if you sell this machine, I can only be your supplier, right? Um, you can't pick another supplier to do it, right? So. Because of that, they actually need very long-term relationships with their clients, right? Uh, so you talk about decades of, of, uh, of relationship, which means that getting into the space for some of these equipment makers is also a very high barrier to entry, right? Uh, because uh, you know, not anyone can just walk in and say, you know what, can I just offer you some precision engineering services? Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way, right? Uh, so, so this is this is where it's very important. Um, so one of their one of their uh, Biggest clients uh, actually is Applied Materials. Uh, they are also uh, they are also a listed company. You can go and Google them as well. So Applied Materials is the largest uh, chip equipment company uh, right now in the world. So remember, I talked about third tier, right? So these guys make the equipment to create those production lines, okay? And they service these clients to actually create those those machines, right? Uh, so if you look at if you look at uh, um, you know the top the top five. Uh, equipment makers, uh, they actually generate almost 60% of all the revenue, right? Uh, so they're very, very large. So they have almost, a, you know, a, a, I would say 23 year working relationship with uh, applied materials. In fact, if you look at their office, you know, in Singapore, they're actually quite close together as well, right? So that the kind of, you can Google map it nowadays. I know we did that, but um, just to give an idea uh, where they are, right? Now, so if you look at, if you look at chip making, chip making is not it's not easy, right? Uh, it's actually very precise. Uh, you can see that actually from start to finish, you're looking at maybe over a thousand steps, right? Now, so if you look at a thousand over steps, you can see how, how many fillers, right? Or, or, or services, or prong services, you actually need to actually get to the end step, right? Um, now, 
You, you know, I, I think in general manufacturing, um, I think it's quite impossible, right, uh, to get margins of 50%, right, gross profit margins of 50% or even net margins of 20, 30%, right. Uh, UMS has actually done that and really kind of gives you an idea on their business model, which means that they, it's an, on an exclusive basis, they work and create those products uh, and then they become the sole supplier. Now, of course, uh, where they're dependent on, their business dependent on whether their client is able to sell those machines, right, uh, to, the, to the next client. So their fortunes are quite tied in Right, uh, uh, to to the to the product they're actually creating as well. Right now, of course, uh, you know, like we mentioned in 2020, 2021, really uh, accelerated uh, the demand and there's a shortage of chips, like some of you guys have highlighted here, um, and that has actually uh, provoked a lot of a lot of these uh, uh, foundry players or manufacturers to actually increase production. Right, uh, one because of COVID or delayed times. Uh, you know, two a lot of uh, during the last two years, there were a lot of shutdowns as well happening, happening as well. And at the same time, everyone was forced to stay at home and work from home. Uh, it, it, I can remember, you know, in 2020, it was, it was quite difficult to even buy an iPad because right? they were all sold out because every all the kids now needed an iPad to, uh, to, to, to study in school. I mean, to stay at home and still go to school, right? Uh, so that, that really accelerated that. Now, um, the question here is, is this a one-off, right? Um, or is this actually, or has COVID just accelerated the work from home or work from anywhere, really? I don't think it's work from home anymore. It's really much, really work from anywhere, right? Um, I think uh, some signs that we're seeing today is that, you know, Google has been actually a very staunch uh, 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 proponent, right? That you can't work from home. You should work from campus. That's why the campus is so beautiful. I think up to last month, very recently, the HR have actually mentioned that they are now uh, moving into a work from anywhere model as well. So uh, when, when we're seeing that, I, I think the whole global workforce is actually starting to change. So therefore, um, the, the need for semiconductors, right, uh, now is individualistic, right, rather than uh, everyone goes to the office. So uh, I, I think that, that that trend, I don't believe uh, that trend would stop. Right? I think it, it's only going to continue, right? Okay. Um, so, so fantastic numbers. Uh, so if you look at what are some of the risks that, that they are involved in, because these companies are like fourth tier, right? So you, you don't get much visibility of where their end numbers are. Uh, sometimes they don't get it as well themselves, right? So because 93% of their revenue, so they are, uh, they, they, they are, they are basically um, applied materials, okay? 93%. Uh, um, uh, so, which means that their fortunes are very tied into applied materials, right? So, you got to watch how applied material works. Now, if you actually look at uh, their share price, there's actually a very strong correlation between uh, UMS and actually applied materials here. Uh, you can see AMAT, right? And, and the green line is actually UMS, right? So, uh, so this is something that uh, you have to watch this space. So, really, to analyze this company, uh, you will want to analyze AMAT, right? So, if AMAT's earnings call are good, right? Uh, likely, they will be a beneficiary as well. All right. Uh, so I want to pass this on to Benny here uh, to kind of look at the, the, the price charts. Okay, thanks, Alvin. So um, most of the semicon or even technology counters are in an uptrend in the long term, right? We have seen, for example, UMS um, going to historical high uh, late 2021. Uh, but like all tech stocks, they have actually pulled back within 20 to 30 percent, like Alvin mentioned earlier, right? So uh, UMS also has come down, I think, about uh, 25, 26 percent from the peak that we see early last uh, early this year. Um, so, again, so I'm going to basically look at the technical perspective of um, the UMS uh, price charts. Uh, again, we always look at technical analysis historically to uh, give us an idea, right, of um, what's possibly going to happen in the future uh, based on the past trends. But of course, we all know that the you know, future trends uh, does not necessarily will follow uh, the past trends, uh, but we use it as a guide, right? So, I basically come up with this chart over here. Uh, if you look at the chart, um, the rest of the other charts are the same indicators as well. We have the blue line on the price chart, and that's the 52-week moving average, which is actually a one-year average. Right? Um, so what happens was whenever there's a pullback in price, if you look at the, the one at the left uh, on the red arrow, whenever it pulls back below the moving average, the price comes down into a downtrend. Um, and then we also look at the RSI indicator at the bottom, which tells me whether the price is oversold, uh, which means that it's relatively low. And if the price is low, normally for a very strong uh, bullish sector, uh, it tends to rebound back again. Uh, so when RSI falls below 30, for example, where I circled it on the RSI indicator at the bottom, 
Uh, that's where you see price bottom now, right? And that would be actually a good opportunity. Uh, number one, because price has actually come down quite significantly. And I just, you know, in any trend, there will be a correction, right? So when RSI goes below 30, that means the price has probably found its support or its bottom, and we can expect the bullish trend to continue, right? So if you look at the second one, it's the same thing. Uh, in 2019, uh, 18, for example, we see also price moving below that moving average. Uh, but as it goes down, I want to wait for the RSI to go below 30 to tell me that the price is really low. Right? So the circle, the second circle that you see there is when the RSI goes below 30. Uh, if you look at the third one, it's the same thing. right? The price goes below the 30 day, uh, the 52 week moving average. It went down there uh, and then it found a bottom uh, in 2020 and, it's now, and then it went to an uptrend again. And now we are seeing the same thing happen, right? The price broke below that uh, moving average. It started to come down. And you look at RSI, although it has not come down to the 30 level, it's quite near oversold level. Uh, maybe it's going to come down a little bit more. I do not know. Uh, but basically, it's quite interesting. It's quite attractive right now uh, based on the historical performance because when RSI goes near 30 or it's oversold level, uh, we're going to expect the price to bottom out and resume its uptrend. All right, so that's uh, where UMS stands at the moment. Uh, back to you, Alvin. Thanks. Um, I, I think I'll kind of leave it to the end to, to, to look at um, this, talk a little bit about this chip shortage, right? I think there are a couple of factors that uh, we have to take in account uh, uh, just, to give, just, just, just to kind of wrap things up. Uh, so I think the second company, I think most of you may have heard of, uh, they call Franken, right? Uh, so they actually begin as a family-run business, right? Uh, and of course, the original family actually has sold out. They still have uh, an office uh, in the Netherlands as well. Um, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, 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 you know it's, run, it's run by professionals, right? Um, and, you know, if you look at kind of the returns that you're getting, you know, it's actually really quite amazing, right? So later we'll look, look at the, the, the price chart. Now, but I want to talk, just kind of zoom in and summarize Frank, Franken a little bit. Um, they are what you call mechatronics, right? So mechatronics is mechanical and electronics. So, so really when, you know, when you need something to turn with electronics, right? Uh, they, are, they are your guys, right? Now, again, right? they are suppliers to chip maker equipment, right? Chip making equipment. Now, if you look at their revenue breakdown, um, actually semiconductor is only 30%, right? Of their, their, their breakdown, right? Uh, then you have medical, you got industrial automation, you got tooling, you got automotive, you got everything else, right? Now, but what is interesting about um, uh, this space is that under their semiconductor, the their, their mechatronics section here, right? Um, Actually, this one customer known as ASML, all right, uh, they only contribute 18% of the group's revenues, 18%, so less than 20%, right? Uh, but they actually account for 90% of their profits. So really, you can almost disregard, you know, 78% you know, of their revenue. Uh, you still get 90% of their profits. So you can imagine how profitable this specific segment is right uh and this is very important to note so you know what what is it that uh that they have done so well and why are they rising stars right now so like i mentioned earlier when we talk about semiconductors no longer created by humans right it's all done by robots and machines right because they're so precise uh and and uh, and you know qc is very important so one of the the key rising stars uh in franken here was because they are actually uh, you know, uh, the, the supplier to what, uh, to ASML, right? One of their components, right? Some of their components in their EUV machine, right? Um, so it's, I believe it stands for X, uh, extreme ultraviolet, okay? Now, this is quite interesting. Now, this technology has been, uh, has been in research uh, since 2006, so almost uh, 12, 13 years they've been investing in this. They invested even up to $6 billion. And I'm talking about ASML, their client. Huh? So ASML here actually spent $6 billion to develop this machine. And a lot of people back then didn't think it was going to work because it was a new way to, uh, to actually manufacture semiconductors. Never been done before. Uh, after $6 billion, they actually managed to do it. Now, this machine... Uh, just to share with you, this machine is not small. It's not like the size of a table. Uh, it, it takes 40 freight containers to assemble this. Uh, it's the size of a bus, okay? 
uh, and uh, you know there are hundreds and thousands of uh, moving parts in there. So so Franken actually creates part of the hundred thousand moving parts in there. Now because they were part of their team to build that part of of the of this of this uh, machine, right? Uh, uh, so of course they have kind of a, a, a sole supplier uh, arrangement now. The interesting thing about this EUV model, why is it so significant, uh, is because uh, a, uh, ASML actually has a close to 99.9% .9 monopoly of the market of this machine, right? One machine costs 150 million US dollars, right? Uh, and Intel just put in a very large order. Now, why? Because when you can buy this machine, not only do you create, you can create smaller uh, transistors, that means you can create even smaller chips, uh, it will lower the cost uh, and it can make it even faster. So imagine it, it's like a, you know, driving from an internal combustion engine, uh, that's how manufacturing has been done, to an electric car, right? Immediately, right? So you get all these benefits immediately. Uh, of course, it took them uh, many, many years. So if you want to look at, um, you want to look at their growth, you must look at ASML, right? Now, ASML, a year, they sell about 40 odd machines. So you can imagine it, one machine is 150 million, right? Now, uh, our research tells us we believe uh, with the rise of AI and the rise of these geopolitical tensions, uh, increase in CAPEX, you, if you are producing a semiconductor, a physical semiconductor, um, these are one of the machines that you definitely want to buy, right? Um, so, so ASML actually has, uh, if, if you look at their, their, their gross profit, it's actually quite amazing. Of course, you can't really see it so much on this chart, uh, but you can go and, go and check it out. Uh, so you're not looking at high volume, but very highly precise, highly profitable per machine. And because, example, they would sell it to Samsung or Intel or TSMC, right? Uh, this machine. So they are the only guys that will buy it. One machine is 150 million. Um, and if they're increasing their production line, they're moving from geopolitical, they're creating uh, extra, I would say, backup lines as well. Um, you're actually going to notice that likely the sales of these machines are, are also going to go up, right? Um, so that's that's a kind of the, the the hidden gem in Franken. You know, if without you having to dig through all that research, uh, this is really what their rising star is, right? Um, so so ASML, in fact, they were so advanced that uh, US. Uh, so ASML is a Dutch company. Um, and they really have a monopoly of this machine. No one else has created it, right? Uh, most of the people back then in 2006 didn't think that this was actually viable and can be done. So, so a lot of people uh, left it only as ML pursued and then they got paid off quite handsomely. Now. So they were so popular in the sense that uh, the US government had to tell them to not sell any of these machines to China. So China legally cannot buy any of these machines, right? Uh, because even though Ch China does a lot of manufacturing, um, actually the equipment to create these semiconductors still lie in the hands of a uh, uh, large part lie in the hand of non-Chinese uh, manufacturers, right? Or this equipment, because they are highly sophisticated, right? Um, I guess the, the, the risk here is that, uh, well, EUV is definitely the new kid on the block and very much uh, rising year on year. Um, if, so the, the risk here is uh, what if Franken loses the ASML job, right? Uh, then, you know, they will still be profitable, but won't be as profitable. But I guess the question is, uh, will investors still find this stock as exciting? Right, so I'm going to pass it on to Benny to look at Franken. All right, thanks, Alvin. So like uh, UMS as well, you can see price has um, uh, fell from the peak in late 2021. Um, price has gone up about 30% for Franken, right? Uh, so what's interesting, I'm going to apply the same principle that we did on UMS. Um, so we actually have a price breaking down below that 30-week moving average. And the RSI has gone not again below 30, where it's oversold, but it's quite near at the bottom there, right? So same thing, we're probably going to expect a rebound like UMS uh, for Franken. And uh, again, if you're looking at a slightly longer term period, maybe about two, three years, the market should continue its trend again. Um, so right now, it is quite uh, also. So again, uh, we're probably going to expect some rebound for Franken. Yeah, back to you, Alvin. All right, thanks, Benny. Okay, so I want to move on quickly. I've got two more to cover. I want to go very quickly. Now, micromechanics, uh, probably also no, needs no introduction. Um, really, what they do, or maybe just to summarize their business models, they are in the consumable space, right? So imagine if, uh, if, if uh, you know, you create a printer, your consumable is actually your, your, your ink, right? Okay, so they basically are the ink creators in, in those machines, right? So as long as machines... 
uh, are more production lines are there, uh, machines are being used to create semiconductors. They are very much part of the consumable space. So very highly recurring revenue kind of space, all right? Um, uh, without going too deeply, but if you look at their, their re in return since IPO, it's really been exceptional, right? 17%, right? Uh, so because their parts need to be replaced frequently, they actually supply those parts, all right? Um, they are very highly linked uh, to, uh, to chip demand as well, right? I think gone are the days where we used to think semiconductors were cyclical. Uh, I don't think they seem to be cyclical anymore, right? Uh, with, with, with really what's happening. The only way it can be cyclical right now is because of external factors like shipping and all that actually uh, delay, right? I don't think there's an issue with demand. Uh, demand is not the issue right now. Uh, supply is the issue, right? Um, uh, so if you can see their, their, their GP margins are 50% for these consumers, very, very high as well, right? Uh, and their net margin is 21%. So they definitely do have an economic mode, right? They are not just any manufacturer here. Of course, just like your car, you know, you need to buy approved parts, right? Uh, you can't just, you know, go the OEM, especially when you're talking about, you know, billions of dollars and your, your end client's Apple, you're not going to skim on cheaper parts, right? So Benny, back to you. All right. So let's take a look at micro mechanics chart. Um, okay, unlike UMS and uh, Franken, uh, the price has only gone down about 17% from its peak uh, late last year, right? Um, you can see that the price has not gone down as aggressive as UMS or Franken. Uh, it is now trading at the 30-week um, moving average. Um, so again, um, you know, it has not gone down to the gone down to its uh, to its oversold level. Uh, because that's where we probably want to find really good price, right? So if you look at previously, when it goes down to the circle that I've shown you, uh, the price has found bottom. Uh, but for this particular chart, he has not really gone down to his oversold level yet. And uh, again, maybe it's going to be supported at this level. So either it's going to come down uh, a little bit more for a correction uh, because maybe it has not come fully corrected yet. Uh, but again, we, if you want to trade this particular stock, it's, there's two ways to go, right? Uh, either the price is going to come down and uh, go to its over uh, sold level uh, when RSI is below 30 or it's going to break out that resistance, right? And the resistance currently is at 350. So probably if it breaks above that 350 resistance level, we may see the continuation of an uptrend. Okay, back to you, Alvin. All right, thanks, Alvin. Okay, so um, the last one is actually AEM Holdings here. Um, I, I think AEM is uh, um, a very kind of, you know, I think it's been in Singapore for a while. It's really a turnaround, a turnaround story, right? Uh, so in the early days, you know, there were lawsuits and it was suspended and, and things like that. And then you have um, a PE firm, right, or venture firm that came in, Nova Telus, that actually turned the company around. They sold out all their, uh, they sold out all their unprofitable business and purely just focused on uh, the business that they thought was, was viable, right, uh, which is really the testing space. So just like any semiconductors today, if you're wondering, you know, where you bought electronics 30 years ago, you know, you're always very worried about warranty, right? Uh, but really, if you look at semiconductors today, electronics today, they are a lot more reliable than they were 30 years ago. Now, one of the big reasons is because of testing, right? So when so before they actually get shipped out, uh, they actually get tested now. So AEM is in that space, right? So the QC space of semiconductors. Now, um, really, I think uh, most most many all manufacturers will need. Uh, what they call automated test equipment. Of course, it cannot be done manually because they're done so fast. It has to be done by machines again. So uh, one of the things that uh, the AEM actually does, uh, actually what they call uh, automated testing equipment, they also do uh, burn tests or stress tests as well, right? Uh, but one of the main things that, uh, that uh, one of the, the, the kind of the rising star in their portfolio, right? Um, you see, when you run these tests in the, in the lab and you actually put it out there, they are very different. Right, so now when we have cars, right, like uh, electric cars or self-driving cars, for example, they actually need real-world testing, right? Um, so what what uh, AEM actually has, or one of the rising stars in their portfolio, is what they call SLT, right? Uh, basically, system-level testing. That means they they actually run it as is they were running it, right? Um, in fact, that space um, is growing at 20% KGA, right, versus the ATE space. So that is one of the little gems in that space if you're actually looking at AEM, right? So um, system level testing is very, very different from your normal uh, lab testing, right? Uh, and, that, and that's actually really one of their, 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 their key drivers of their business right now. Now, of course, uh, AEM wants to be, you know, the top five in the world uh, in terms of testing equipment. Um, 
Uh, again, if you look at the margins, net profit margins, they are fairly good as well. Okay, uh, so one of their largest clients is actually Intel, right? So uh, Intel being a uh, such a large space, right? They recently bought uh, Tower Semiconductor as well, right? So we might see some space, uh, we might see some growth because their client has now grown even bigger. All right. So I uh, very quickly just to kind of wrap it up. If you're looking at the share price and you think it's very expensive, uh, you must look at them versus all the other test equipment. So if you look at EM Holdings, they are tiny or minuscule in terms of market cap compared to all the other uh, testers. Right? They they strive to be a top five, and of course, Tamasic is now actually one of their their. Uh, their shareholders, substantial shareholders. So, Benny, I'll pass it back to you. All right. Thanks, yeah. Alvin. I know we've got to rush things, but... Yeah. Uh, so, um, EM chart has been also very bullish, right? But it, it has not declined as aggressively as UMS or Franken earlier, where you know, both of these stocks fell about 25-30%. Uh, but this, this price has gone down. Uh, but the thing is that because every counter is different in its characteristics, right? So, although the decline was little, uh, but if you look at the same principle, the RSI has actually gotten below... Uh, the 30 level or the oversold level um, actually about two weeks ago and it's now rebounding, right? Um, so again, uh, we're probably going to expect a rebound as well for AEM. Um, and to answer the FH Tan's question, um, normally it takes about two to three months uh, from technology stocks because this is a very strong bullish trend uh, sector. Um, therefore, we see price moving normally about two or three months before it makes a new high. Uh, but then again, historically, for example, it also takes sometimes a long time, about a year, like in 2019, for example, uh, before the price makes a new high. So uh, these are factors that we can't change, but definitely we are looking at, you know, uh, two months or three months before it makes a new high, or it could even take a year, uh, depending on how long the correction is. And because we have all this crisis that's happening right now, and also the rising of interest rates, market may be softened a little bit, uh, but this trend, I think, should be able to continue. Lah. So AM also provides... Uh, you know, quite an opportunity right here because, again, we are not giving any financial advice or whatsoever, but technically, it is oversold and that's where normally traders will look for opportunities. Okay, um, thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think we are now open for Q&A, right? So, of course, yeah. if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to kind of answer them. I, I didn't manage to go through all my slides or finish all of them here. Uh, yeah, I think we have answered most of the questions earlier. Um, yeah. There's one uh, question that came in just recently. So from Prudence Wong, uh, how does Ukraine war affect ships? Because in Singapore, short term, with neon gas supply is affected. Yeah, I, so, you know, there are several analysts around the world and we, we kind of get different numbers, right? Uh, so neon gas uh, is a byproduct of... Um, uh, actually, I don't have a slide on this, actually. If I can just share my slides... Uh, neon, neon gas is, um, I do have a slide that I can share this, right? Uh, it's very much um, part of uh, or byproduct of steel making, uh, which, is, uh, which is very much, and, and, and Ukraine, surprisingly, I think up to five, five years ago, they were 90 or up to 2014, they were 90% of the world's supply of neon gas. Uh, and neon is very, very important in uh, semiconductor manufacturing, right? Because they're using their lasers. Uh, so because of the, the disruption right now, uh, right now, uh, the latest numbers I've seen is anywhere between 50 to 70% uh, of the world's supply. Um, some, some, some articles I've read that says 50, some have said 70. So whichever you want to take. Uh, of course, right now with what's happening, there's no way when you such have such a massive choke point, right, of neon, um, you you know, again, we're going to have a chip supply shortage, right? I think that is the, the reality of it. And I think uh, uh, most, most manufacturers have said that they actually have a six-month stockpile. Uh, but I don't believe that's, you know, I, I, I guess the question is how long is this uh, war going to last? Um, and how long, how long will it take before supplies can be reinstated? So here we have another, another issue here, right? Uh, not COVID this time, but really it's a war. Um, uh, so production will be affected, uh, but I don't believe Capex is going to hold off because when you're going to build a factory, build a line, you actually have a timeline. So if you are investing in equipment testing manufacturers or you're investing in uh, uh, those that supply those equipment, right? Um, I don't think they're going to be that affected, right? Uh, as much as those that are in production because they're two very different business models. Okay, maybe I'll take Han's uh, question. Can you share the reasons between the big dip for both VMS and Franken uh, as compared to, let's say, AEM or uh, micro uh, mechanics, right? 
Uh, so if you look at UMS and Franken, the price has gone up way much bigger than uh, the other two counters. Uh, and of course, if price goes up fast and big, the, the correction will be bigger as well. Uh. So that's why you see uh, some of these counters has gone up 30% or gone down 25%, but some counters only went, out, went down about 15-16%. Uh, the reason why was because the price has gone up actually quite aggressively earlier, and therefore the correction is bigger as well. Uh. Okay, next one. Um, we have two more questions. I think we only have two more questions left that we can answer. Uh, thank you so much, guys, for your questions. Um, uh, Hansing is asking, out of these four stocks, which one would you recommend in terms of growth or dividend? Uh, well, this is, this is something which is difficult for us to answer, but technically, if I were to look at the charts earlier, if I'm someone who wants to look for a really good opportunity when price is low, uh, based on the three charts, I would look at uh, UMS, um, AEM and also uh, Franken, right? Because these counters, if I shown you earlier, has already gone to its oversold levels and therefore we may expect a rebound. Um, Yavin, you want to add to that? Yeah, actually I like, um, I, think, I think growth, I like uh, Franken and also uh, AEM, right? Um, why I like AEM, uh, one of the reasons is because they, you know, again, I don't know where the end, end mile is going to be. Uh, but those of you who do follow crypto, uh, you know, Intel has recently come up and said that uh, actually they have patented and they are building uh, ASIC application specific integrated circuits for Bitcoin mining. Um, and they will actually be manufacturing these Bitcoin mining machines, right? Uh, so if, uh, I don't know if AEM has, uh, will be a beneficiary of that because they have a long standing relationship with Intel. Uh, and Intel, knowing Intel, they are a fully integrated manufacturer. That means from start to finish, they don't outsource anything, right? Uh, and of course, the very recent uh, purchase of uh, Tower Semiconductors. And if you look at Tower Semiconductors, they're not like a high-tech uh, uh, kind of semiconductors that they create. So really, I think it's leaving a lot of analysts wondering why, why are they buying this, right? And could it be for uh, ASIC purposes, right? Uh, so those are my, my personal opinion. Um, of, I, I would take these two. Uh, generally, I'm, I'm less concerned with the short-term shortages and war and everything else. I think fundamentally, a lot of these stocks, uh, their fundamentals and their macro views are very much intact. Uh, so, so, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's um, I, I, I think to answer Casey's question as well, I, I think for some players, it's definitely not a cyclical industry anymore. I don't think semiconductors are going to be cyclical anymore. Uh, of course, we will get dips, but you know we're not getting cycles where you know you know you're looking at five to ten year kind of cycles. I, I don't think we're seeing those kind of cycles. Uh, we might see dips and uh, drops in demand, but not so much those major like you see like commodity cycles, right? Not so much that. Yeah, I think the only thing that we can see is basically, of course, semiconductor and technology is going to be here to stay for a long time, and the growth is going to be exponential, right? Um, I mean, now, now you look at. Electric vehicles are is going to replace uh, combustion engines very soon, and they are artificial intelligence and so on and so forth. So definitely, the, the trend is there. Um, it's only when you look for opportunities to get in, right? So I've shown you the charts earlier. Uh, this may some of the counters that you want to consider and 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 dive deeper, lah. Um, now I think that's all the time that we have for for Kong. Um, you know, we can't cover all the other counters because it's too big, right? About what we have covered is actually these are the larger players in in SJ in uh, Singapore. Uh, stock market. So um, if you want to reach us, you can go to our exhibition booth and you can ask some queries there. You know, our guys will be there to answer you uh, if you have any other queries uh, regarding what we do at Equity Striker as well. All right. Yeah. So uh, actually, we, we did write a super, uh, very detailed report. I think some of you guys are asking about Valutronics, Grand Venture, and all that's actually covered in a two, two part report. Uh, go check out sg.equitystriker.com. All those articles are actually published on. Uh, on, on, on our medium on our medium site, right? So you can go and check it out. It's all there. Uh, and of course, check out sg.equitystriker.com. That's really where you can get all the information, all the data on, on stocks on, uh, on, on the SGX for absolutely free, right? Just do a search on the top right, right? You want from REITs, uh, anything from REITs to, to, to data, to, to articles, uh, it's actually all there for you. And that goes for Mayfong as well. Do check out uh, sg.equitystriker.com. I think that's all about the time we have, uh, Alvin. Yeah. Yep. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, wish you all the best, and I have, hopefully this will, this year will be a much better year uh, than the past few years. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Elvin and Benny, and thank you to all of our viewers. Wow! After that, is it going to be another wave of punters getting back into Singapore tech stocks? Well, we might have Elvin and Benny to blame for that. <laughs> we'll see. So, folks, we've come to the end of day one 
But there's lots more happening tomorrow at the Singapore Trading Festival and also next weekend as well. But tomorrow, we are joined by our broker community to discuss more about REITs, rising interest rates, trading using common indicators, and we're going to talk more about Singapore's tech sector. But also, we'll be talking about Singapore's construction sector. We'll talk about investing with inflation. And of course, China, that big gigantic player in Asia. What's the investment outlook going to be for this year? Plenty of exciting and potentially very profitable information there. Folks, we start at 9 a.m. tomorrow right here. Same place, same channel, and we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you for joining us today, and we wish you a great day ahead.